to hyphenate with her here tonight. So Sophie, welcome. Thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction and also for just updating me on all of these amazing things that you guys are doing. I'm hoping I can hop on from my digital um, distance and find a way to get involved in some way. Um, so that was a pretty good introduction, but I think I'll perhaps start by, um, I'll start by just giving a little context about how I've become such a mycological thinker. Um, I was raised in the Hudson Valley and I was very, very fascinated with mushrooms and with fungi and rootlets and all of those things that were gross. Like my family had a compost heap and I spent a lot of time looking at it <laughs> and sitting with it. Um, and, you know, that quickly bloomed into a kind of amateur fascination with the philosophy, with the biology, with the herbal medicinal qualities of fungi. And, you know, as I pursued a career, um, an education and a career in writing, I still followed my love of fungi. Um, when I was 16, though, I fell life-threateningly ill. And it took about seven years to get the correct diagnosis of an incurable connective tissue disease. And at the time when I finally received this diagnosis, I had just found out about mycorrhizal fungi and that certain types of fungi provide the connective tissue of soil and of ecosystems. And it seemed like an incredibly synchronous moment that I had an insufficiency of connective tissue in my body, and yet I was devoted to the connective tissue of the soil and a forest. And even if I couldn't cure my body, I could, you know, let my idea of a self relax, let my idea of where healing was supposed to happen relax. Um, and perhaps I could fuse my healing experience with another species, with mycorrhizal fungi. So that's a little context. Um, I think I'm gonna share a screen. Can I do that? Um, is that working, everyone? Um, I can't see chat. So if someone could just come in and tell me if it's working. Okay, yay. It's good. It's great, thank you so much, okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, I wanna start with a little bit of a meditation so we can actually relax that skin silhouetted fiction of a self, of a single species, of an individual, and start with a fungal meditation that's been helping me center myself in a leakier, more interspecies type of mindset as I approach my work, um, mythologically, scientifically, and creatively. Um, so I'm gonna read a bit of a piece that's about this idea of the supracellular state, which is a unique um, experience in certain plants and many, many mycelial fungi. So down by the Hudson River, I sometimes think I can scent the moment when the tide reverses and the estuary injects its salt water response into a freshwater question. The air bristles, the wake of a passing motorboat cuts crisp V's in the water. The salt in the air acts like salt in soup. It enhances the flavor of the honeysuckle, the locust blooms, the sun-toasted cedar planks tilted against the boat building shop. Mahican tuff, the river is called by the Munsee Lenape people, which means the river that runs both ways. The ocean refluxes into the river. Is it then still a river? Or is it a brackish finger probing into the landscape? I squint as if trying to mark the spot in the water where opposed currents intertwine like the snakes of the caduceus. The water surface spangled with willow frond reflections keeps it secret, but at my feet, I spot something else. The velveteen dome of a mower's mushroom pokes up from the grass. I bend down, noticing how the diminutive parasol structure disappears into the fine grain soil. I know that although this fellow looks lonely, he is really less of a fellow and more of a swarming festivity below ground. Mushrooms, of course, are the reproductive flourishes of fungal life forms that live in soil or shrub su substrate as a thread-like filamentous web called mycelium. Mycelium is composed of long tubes of hyphae. One network might have thousands of different hyphal tips, all capable of forking, fusing, foraging, and creating increasingly complex connections with other fungal systems and vegetal life forms. I lightly press my finger to the mushroom, imagining my mind slipping like a yolk from the egg of my brain into my arm and then through my finger into the damp body of the mushroom. 
Deeper still, my consciousness dives on mycelial threads into the underworld. It holds tight to a roving nuclei as it travels through a chain of opening and closing doors like door-like pores called septa. If I had entered into an animal cell, I might have found myself profoundly confined, abiding by the strict rules of inner and outer, organelles bolted to the floor. But here in this mycelial network, I am not confined to one node. I can wander through the whole web. My ride is only possible because fungi are biologically unusual, confounding standard ideas of both the cell and the self. In 1665, Robert Hooke was the first to observe a microorganism under a microscope. It was these observations that over the next 200 years informed the concept of the cell as a fundamental unit of multicellular life. The concept of the cell as a stable and foundational unit, while applies to most of us, is not universally true. Many plants and filamentous fungi employ a type of cellularity much closer to verb than it is to noun. While hyphae are commonly referred to as fungal cells, the term is misleading. A classical cell can be envisioned as a discrete bundle of protoplasm with one nucleus, neatly bounded by an extracellular wall, one bead in a necklace. But fungal hyphae behave differently. They create supracellular networks. Hyphae are separated by cross walls called septa. However, these septa possess pores that open and close, creating a fluid passway, passageway through a hyphal thread. For mycelial fungi, there is no discrete bead on the necklace. The necklace becomes a flume through which organelles and cytoplasmic material flow. A single hypha can at one time house multiple nuclei. And given fungi's proclivity for promiscuity, those nuclei may not even carry the same genome as the original mycelial network. Fungal webs can fuse, exchanging nuclei and promoting genetic diversity. I reached the end of a hyphal tip bounce on a plush organelle called the Spitzenkorper that sits at the head and scream as it cleaves beneath me, splitting off in two directions. A nucleus collides with me from behind, then another ramifies. The pressure passes my mind through the needle of another mind. I let myself fork and divide. Many days I have sat at the river and imagined I am another being, a hummingbird, a sturgeon, the barberry bush, the Wolbachia bacteria pinwheeling through the colorless blood of the monarch butterfly. The exercise necessarily fails, but the empathy, empathy muscle it strengthens is crucial. In an age when anthropocentrism is fueling mass extinction and ecocide, it seems vitally important to practice thinking like other beings, or even when we feel ambition, trying to think alongside the deep time oscillations of ecosystems. We have behaved like ordinary cells for too long, pretending there is no movement from the inside to the outside. We have believed for too long that our minds belong to us as individuals. But advances in everything from forest ecology to microbiology biology show us that we are not siloed selves, but relational networks built metabolically by every biome-laced breath, thinking through filamentous connectivity rather than in one neatly bounded mind. I think of the spider who sitting in, um, sitting like the iris inside a lacy eye, tugs and flexes and tightens its grip on different strings, creating an interrogative experience with web and with world. Scientists have likened this behavior to the activity of a brain itself, sifting through and reacting to stimuli. Each tug is a question, each returning vibration a reply. In this way, spiders can sense which parts of their web attract more flies and focus their continued silk production on those areas. They can tell when prey has been caught, and studies have shown that when webs are deliberately damaged, spiders perceive the damage and locate the spot and hurry there to make repairs. Even more strangely, extended cognition researcher Hilton Japyasu has shown that cutting a part of the silk dramatically shifted and disoriented the behavior of the spider and seemed to have imitate the effects of a lobotomy. This begs the question, where is the spider's mind? Is it inside the spider's actual brain or is it in the web itself? I think my mind is not just in my body. It is in my entire web, my entire web of relations, fungal, geological, microbial, vegetal, ancestral that weave together my specific ecosystem. 
Sometimes in the morning when I call on each of these beings and a practice I loosely name gathering counsel, I imagine that I am like a mycelial network below ground, opening up the septa pores and my branching hyphae. I am opening myself up to a supercellular state whereby my mind can pass through my thread of relations into the minds of woodchucks, black bears, chanterelles, and juniper trees. If a cursory study of somatics shows us that we think with our entire body, then how much better could we think if we thought with our entire web of wild kin? I want to think and feel and weep and grieve with my whole multi-species polynucleated mind. I want to let the yoke of my small desires slide into otherness. I want to nucleate a symbiotic quest for a better future. Throw open all the doors of my cells. Let my river run both ways. So thank you for that small little meditative beginning. Um, so the grounding for this talk, this conversation is the actual ground of our real relations in a five mile to 10 mile radius around us. The understanding that we think better when we think with our whole mycelial web of kin than we do inside the atomized prison of anthropocentric selves. So I want to begin many, many, many thousands of years ago. And I want to begin with the recognition that we live in a very, very narrow slice of culture that represents an extremely partial and modern view of human beings and storytelling. But we have been dialoguing with nature for over a hundred thousand years. That's the amount of time when the human brain has been relatively as large as it is now. These nine red lines etched on a flake of stone in the Blombos cave in South Africa have recently pushed back human art making to at least 73,000 years ago, 30,000 years earlier than the earliest known abstract drawings in Europe. Mythologist Sean Kane calls this dialogue with the earth, be it spoken or drawn or sculpted, myth telling. We interact with our larger ecosystem, our larger shared body through this polytemporal multi-species dialogue. We ask questions and we receive answers and ask again. The key to this experience is that it is not one-sided. It is curious, relational, and interrogative. What we learn through this dialogue becomes a type of communication we call myth. Prehistory is a term used to explain the time that came before literacy, but almost all of human history is oral culture. All of human history is prehistory. Almost all of human myth predates the written word, stretching back 750,000 years to the time when hominids migrated out of Africa into Europe and Asia. While the first voices and songs and tales have not reached the seashell curvature of our ears, we still have access to incredible material culture preserved in caves as statuettes and figurines. In these earliest images across continents, we can notice some important themes. First, beginning around 20,000 years ago, there is the veneration of goddess figures in various physical forms, but with consistent connections to animals and the moon from Lake Baikal in Siberia, all the way down to the Pyrenees. The most striking, but however, you know, we wanna not enshrine anthropocentric divine. We must realize that the sacred is bigger than human dualisms and um, human gender binaries. The most striking theme of prehistoric art is not just goddesses, it is mostly the absence of humans or straight bodied humans in general. In fact, when we do have images of humans, they are less human and more animal. They're something we would call a theriomorph. Theriomorph comes from the Greek therion for beast and metamorphon, meaning to change shape. It is often used to describe deities that have the ability to shape shift or who display human animal hybridity. So let's look at this Seriamor figure. This is the lion man and he is 40,000 years old. His body is lustrously worn bearing the mark of tender caresses. He has been touched to gleaming, a divine made for your hands, not for your head. Then look at the trough bear shaman or as I would call him spirit worker, another Theriomorph. At first we gaze with awe. This is one of the earliest representations of imaginative thinking. 
He is the proof that as human makers could imagine and make something that did not exist in their ordinary environs. They could respond to the world creatively and add something back truly novel. But although this interpretation is neat and seems to put a nice stake in the river of human evolution designating a spot where we became creative self-reflective beings, I don't think it does total justice to what we are seeing. I want to offer that what we are seeing is actually a profound type of myth-making that is dialoguing not with fantasy, but with deep time and biological truth. We are so enculturated with Eurocentric epistemologies that we forget that for most of human history, we have been asking questions of our environment and getting back accurate data. Okay, this data wasn't quantitative with Western tools of measurement. Our tools of measurement were our bodies, our intuition, our dreams, our relational webs that like spider webs could catch interesting ideas, but it didn't make this information any less accurate. Modern medicine and science today is in many ways just backtracking, extracting, and reappropriating the botanical and scientific knowledge indigenous people have been holding for millennia. Poet and translator Robert Bringhurst proposes that myth can be seen as an alternative science. Both science and myth seek to understand the natural world. While scientists quantifies elements, the myth teller personifies them. So, what if we look at these figures as being highly accurate representations of our environment, evolutionary past as anim animals, our symbiotic environment in general? What if deeper even than that, we saw these blended beings as representative of the origin of our very selves? Our bodies today are the product of an ancient bacterial merger. Around 2.7 billion years ago, free living prokaryotes melted into one another to form the mitochondria and organelles of the complex cells that build our bodies today. And we can even see the anarchic cross-species collaboration of the lion man and the trough frere theriomorph in the depths of our belly buttons, reminding us of our flesh rhizome, tying us once to another body, a womb. Wombs are in fact possible only because of retroviruses 200 million years ago invaded proto-mammals, teaching us how to develop the protein syncytin that creates the syntrophoblast layer of the placenta. And these wombs are only possible because of an ancestor that learned how to take the ocean and its eggs into its own body when climatological pressure shifted us onto dry land. So I ask, do we look out of thousands of years of theriomorphic beings as being fanciful primitivism, or do we realize that they represent an intimate dialogue with deep time and with our evolutionary lineage of kin? Um, these theriomorphs, by virtue of their interspecies existence, have information on how to sustainably live within a web of relations. How do we grow and eat food while tending the earth that these beings are born from? How do we honor the ancestors, human and more than human? All of this requires a fungal supracellularity, an ability to flow between forms, between species, to accept interstitial intelligence and celebrate hybridity. Dionysus with his bullhorns, his snake and vegetation is a direct rhizomatic continuation of this ancient type of intuition that biological and sacred novelty arrives through anarchic mergers, intracorporality. Category violation, it turns out, isn't the aberration. It is the norm and the very basis for most of life. It is the biological ground for the greatest evolutionary leaps. My favorite mythic metaphor and the one that guides all of my explorations comes from such a collaboration. Here we have the first underworld myth, well before Inanna descended into the underworld, well before Hades absconded with Persephone. Some 416 million years ago, plants made it onto dry land, but these plants were not the plants you and I know as sturdy trees and flowers. They didn't yet have roots. Luckily enough, fungi were already soil dwellers. Fungi are at least a billion years old. Plants learn to have roots from these early fungi, depending on the fungi to keep them plugged into nutrients and place for millions of years before the two developed a converged evolution, creating lignin-based woody roots that mutualistically paired with mycorrhizal fungi. Still to this day, 90% of plants depend on these mycorrhizal connections. The landscapes, the forests, the food you eat, the flowers you give to lovers, all are a product of an intrabodily cross-species collaboration 
As forest ecology has developed, we see that it is this web of collaboration between fungi and vegetation and bacteria and dead matter um, that constitutes the very connective tissue between being and creates delicately synchronized trophic, wa trophic waves of decaying matter, blooming bacterial biomes, released minerals, and soil regeneration. Just like fungi taught plants how to root into the soil, so do myths teach us how to root into relation with our ecological and social landscapes. They seek to express ultimate truths with personified elementals. They narrativize a deep understanding of our connections to more than human timescales. As poet Robert Bringhurst pointed out, and I mentioned before, myth is not antagonistic to science, but rather an alternative science in and of itself. Myth aims like science at perceiving and expressing ultimate truths. While a scientist quantifies reality, a myth teller personifies it. But we are living in a strange time now when most of our myths are uprooted, deracinated. We think we have myths, but really these stories are like houseplants, cut off from the mycorrhizal complexity of the soil and therefore unable to honor the cycle of decay and rebirth and refruit as something freshly adapted to our current environmental conditions. Um, so some fungal systems are constituted by these mycelial systems below ground. Um, eschewing body plans, they become maps of relationship wherever they occur. They branch and fork and fuse to constellate um, the relational network of other species and beings. I like to say that just as when you pour fungi in, into an ecosystem, it becomes a map of relationships. So should your myths pour themselves into your web of kin, becoming a map of your ecology of relationships. Fungi are maps of ecosystems and myths should re represent webs of relatedness rather than a single species or narrative perspective. Okay, let's see what, yeah. Um, okay, moving through, I'm gonna skip this part and move to Osiris. Um, just give me one second and bear with me. Um, the way I've begun to understand how there could be mythic figures. So in my area of study, I really studied mythic systems in the Mediterranean basin from the end of the Paleolithic to the start of the Neolithic, then into the Bronze Age. How do we move from these partnership-based earth reverent societies where you see these theriomorphs to more dominating hierarchical cultures? And as I did that research, I noticed something really interesting, which is that there were all of these figures that arrived at different time peri periods and in different places, but seemed to have a common through line of attributes. They were associated with fermentation, with the moon, with women, with catalyzing ex ecstasy, with um, dance, with revolution, with slaves and social outcasts. And I thought, are they all different beings? Are they all different um, heroes or, or deities? Or are they like mushrooms that look artificially like individuals, but all connected to a deeper mythic mycelium below ground. So I've begun to um, think about the, the vegetal gods, the gods associated with fermentation, with vegetation, with cows, with moon and with women, as all being these, mar these mushrooms above ground of this older mythic mycelium that's been growing for millennia. And so I think I'm gonna, um, uh, go through a couple of these figures and begin to rewild them, plant them back into their context so we can understand what they were environmentally responding to. Um, you know, in rewilding the myths, we must understand that myths arise from particular ecosystems. Just as mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of underground mycelia, so are myths the above ground manifestation of specific ecologies. Myths are momentary eruptions of beings that have been growing for millennia below ground. As a mythic figure, Orpheus is now understood to have been a title rather than a single character. And lyric prophets through the centuries stepped into the role of the divine lyrist to sing his Orphic hymns. Dionysus, the god of the vine, appears without warning, throwing cities into disorder. Although archeological evidence shows that he is one of the oldest pre-Olympic gods, he is paradoxically always personified as a newcomer or a stranger. He fruits up across the Mediterranean in different cities, often with different appearances, offering a variety of fermented beverages. But the real Dionysus is the mycorrhizal system of vegetal gods, 
weaving a net that is ready to pop up and papawi wherever nature-based ecstatic wisdom is needed. But these mushrooms are also necessarily momentary. They die back just like the vegetal gods of the Mediterranean in order to nourish and revitalize the soil and save themselves from becoming stale. I like to say that revision is decay. It is the acknowledgement that most of the work happens underground. Um, each myth is the mushroom of a certain place, an eruption suited to a specific patch of moss, sulfur deposits, decaying wood, um, humidity, and forest floor. These mythic eruptions are the moments when a culture senses the need to reproduce, to spread, to find new food, to shift direction. They are reproductive flourishes. Entering into the open air, they sporulate old knowledge in new ways. A hero is not an individual, it is a reproductive event. So I wanna start with one of my favorite of the vegetal gods, Osiris, or as I call him, the original green man. Um, so, here, okay, the fields laugh, the gods offering descends, reads one of the earliest references to the god Osiris and the old kingdom pyramid text. Carved into stone, these texts date back to around 23,000 BCE, planting Osiris and a world so far removed um, from ours that any attempt to enter it resembles a dreamer trying to recount a dream. Also called Usir, one of the most important gods of ancient Egypt, Osiris straddled the Paleolithic and the Neolithic, hunting and gathering, moving into sedentary agriculture, uh, agricultural civilization. The earliest mentions of the Osiris myth are in the pyramid texts, the first Egyptian funerary texts, which appeared on the walls of burial chambers during the fifth dynasty, during the 24th century BCE. But representations of him are rare before the new kingdom when he was shown in an archa archaizing form as a mummy with his arms crossed on his breast, one hand holding a crook and the other a flail. The origin of Osiris is obscure. Perhaps he was a local god of Busiris in lo Lower Egypt, and he may have initially been the personification of a Chthonic snake-like underworld um, deity. Thankfully, the Egyptians were skilled artisans with a penchant for storytelling monuments and memorializing their rituals and funerary rites. Just as a constellation draws the stars into a larger picture, we can use these material fragments to constellate an image, a dream of the vegetal god of the underworld. We have numerous images of him painted on scrolls, etched into limestone. In almost all of them, he is depicted as green, wearing the, fe the feathered atef, um, headdress that prefigures his hawk son Horus, another theriomorph. His legs are often bound with mummy wrapping, firmly attaching his lower half to the underworld and the regenerative cycle of dirt and death. The fusion of legs echoes with older Paleolithic serpent gods and goddesses. His human form is emerging from the underworld and the snakeskin of an older, less anthropocentric order of divinity. He straddles elements, species, he is born of sky and dirt, with his father the land god Geb and his mother the sky goddess Nut. His child will be a bird. He holds the crook and the flail. The crook is his ability to work with animals, specifically sheep, while the flail will thresh wheat. His responsibility is both to the above um, ground world of plants and to the world of animals, and it literally crosses his heart. He is responsible for agriculture and for wilderness, so the negotiation of boundaries, water and dirt, life and death. He slips in and out of sober and systematic cultivation of fields and plants into the dreamier realm of ecstatic intoxication, introducing beer to his people and traveling the world with his wife Isis to share his potent sacrament. His worship is associated with the Ba or soul, the word was associated with the ram and the worship of the horned animal. Clearly, we have arrived at a very ancient version of a European vegetal figure known as the green man, wearing the horns that will later be inherited by gods like Dionysus, Cernunos, and Pan. But unlike the vegetal gods that follow him, connected no doubt by a lively mycelium below ground, Osiris is not in control of the elements. No, he is the elements. Um, he doesn't passively watch as the Nile floods the land, nourishing the soil. His body is the river, swelled by monsoons in the highlands of current day Ethiopia and withering into death and the underworld during seasons of drought. 
Um, and the Osirian river flows right into the fields, making them laugh. Um, the god is less being and more relationship, water and soil mixing to make fertile, fertile loam, yeasts and wheat and heat fermenting into sacrament, sky and earth, animal and plant. In a version of the Osirian myth homologous to the current day, the green god arrives just at the moment when the sun god Ra has almost overheated the world to the point of death. Aided by his cunning wife, his cunning wife Isis, Osiris manages to overcome the older god and offer his cooling waters to the bake, baked land. We are living in a time of ecological entropy. The sun god Ra is our own addiction to progress. We need more than ever the cooling waters of different stories. Osiris can teach us how to think like a river, how to think like an ecosystem of interconnection. We need to make decisions from the standpoint of relationships rather than the fictional idea of an isolated species. Unfortunately, after Osiris's initial vegetal celebration, his myth turns tragic. The myth, and this version of course is late. So we always have to realize that when we receive a written myth, it's usually been an oral myth for thousands of years before that, and that it's been through a telephone process of translation by empires coming in, different successive waves of, of hierarchy and kings. And so whenever we get a written myth, it's a palimpsest, which is a palimpsest that is in a manuscript is when one, one's written over the old writing. And sometimes you can see the writing peeking up, but it's been written over and co-opted. So we always have to remember that we're getting the, the most recent version. Um, but in this Romanized version, this late version of Osiris's story, the story is that his brother says jealous of his power and devises an elaborate ruse to seize his throne. He hosts a party and he has this beautiful cedar box made to exactly fit Osiris's dimension. And then he creates this game and he says, whoever fits exactly in the box is supposed to be sovereign. And of course, Osiris gets totally um, hoodwinked by this, um, this little game. And when Osiris lays himself in Set's box, it's clearly a fit. And at that moment, Set and his henchmen leap forward and hack the king to pieces and kill him. They close the box and set it out to sea. The myth has many variations, the most complete of which are unreliable. But the short version says that Isis, Isis recovered her husband's body and managed briefly to resurrect him in the papyrus swamps, just long enough to copulate with him as she hovered above his body in the form of a kite. Set interferes again. He chops the, uh, his, brother's bodies, his brother's corpse into 14 pieces, a fact that scholars have connected to the 14 days of the waning moon, making Osiris a lunar king. But the real magic happens when Isis, now pregnant with her bird son, alchemizes her horror and grief by planting her husband's dismembered body parts across Egypt. I, Osiris's body, no longer king, becomes the kingdom itself. You know, I always say there's there's always an obvious lesson here, which is what is your box? What is the box that fits you perfectly, but if you step into it, it will kill you. In capitalism, this means that maybe you're really good at making money doing something that's very bad for the environment. Like you step into a box that actually undoes the ground that holds you up. So whenever I tell the Osiris Smith, I always say like, what is your box that fits you perfectly, but ultimately will be your coffin? Um, but I think that Osiris has an even bigger, bigger, messier lesson for us, compost. Veneration of the dead God was focused primarily on man-shaped garden baths called Osiris vegetons, where yearly priests would mulch soil, wheat, wine, spices, food, and seeds for a month ladling water onto the sacred compost bin until a few stray seeds sprouted from the god. The compost god was venerated and then lovingly buried in a hillside or slipped into the river, completing the virtuous cycle of life and death, growth and decay. Our ecosystems are constituted by, by cycles of growth and decay. Interruptions in this rhythm can have really strange effects on and highlight why life must always be balanced by decomposition. During the Carboniferous period, nearly 360 million years ago, a bloom of early woody-based plants created huge deposits of dead vegetal matter that began to pile up without decomposing. 
side note here, since writing this book and writing this talk, I've read some really interesting counter theories to this. So I'll just say like, there are some interesting counter theories about how this is not true, but mythically we will go with it. Um, Merlin Sheldrake um, postulates in his captivating book on fungi and tangled life that as these layers of dead wood accumulated, so much carbon was captured that carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere actually dropped drastically, causing a global cooling event. The fossilized remains of these compacted layers of undigested matter are now the source of our worst friend, coal and fossil fuels, the very substances fueling climate change today. Sheldrake hypothesizes that it wasn't until white rot fungus learned how to decompose and compost that a positive, the climate began to stabilize. So we can, you know, play with this, massage this a little bit mythically and say, the layers of undecayed coal represent a period of fungal absence. And this can call to mind the figure, I, I would say, of Jesus. Unlike Osiris and Orpheus and Dionysus and all of these other vegetal gods in the Mediterranean, who generously leave their dismembered bodies to compost back into their actual kingdoms, their actual web of supercellular kin, Jesus's disembodied resurrection removes him from the cycle of death and decay. So he has all the attributes of these Mediterranean gods. The one that he doesn't have is that he interrupts this cycle, this embodied cycle. Um, Christianity and its offspring, patriarchal capitalism, recall this fungal absence of the Carboniferous period. This toxic layer is of undigested matter. Fixated on ascension, Christianity forgets that you can't disappear the body. It has a habit of sticking around. We are all struggling to step out of our boxes individually and globally. Capitalism, anthropocentrism, systems of hierarchy and domination. But like our plastic forks and toxic runoff, this waste cannot just be thrown away. If we simply throw out what doesn't work, it will begin to build up and swamp us. You know, most people think that you can just pretend there's no waste, but when you say that there's no waste, you're really offloading it onto a community that didn't make it in the first place. That in, you know, cities and first world countries, we're really good at shipping our waste away rather than taking responsibility for it and composting it. This is also true in terms of paradigms that uh, have put us in positions of privilege, that once we realize they're poisonous, we want to just leave them. But the truth is we have to take responsibility for them, for the certain types of privilege that have landed us in, in positions whereby we create um, harm and ecocide. Um, so in, Osiris invites us to do an inventory of beliefs. Where are our boxes? Where do we fit neatly into a paradigm that will ultimately kill us and all that we love? Okay, so Osiris is this first vegetal fermentation god, and I think I'll move into my favorite one, which is Dionysus. Um, so Osiris fruits in Egypt as a green god of rivers and beers, but as the mythic mycelium of vegetation and fermentation probes through the underworld of the Mediterranean, it changes to suit its ecology. When it fruits in Greece and Greece, Greece and Crete takes on a different name and a different set of plants and fungal and animal allies. We can actually map the spread of fermentation and the spread of these gods. They happen contiguously. The mycelium stretches below ground and fruits up wherever fermentation becomes ritually important, starting somewhere around where this old Stone Age Paleolithic makes way for the early Neolithic. You know, we first see these fermentation rites um, with the Natufians who lived in what is now Syria, Palestine, Israel, and Jordan from around 13,000 BCE to 9,500 BCE, brewing primitive, probably psychedelic beer, um, most likely before they ever baked a loaf of bread. Many scholars now agree that fermentation of alcohol comes before um, using wheat for bread, which makes sense as brewing is actually much easier than baking bread. Um, for beer, all you have to do is take some cereal and put it in water and you start to fer ferment something. You know, I oftentimes say these fermentation gods um, are actually our um, way of making, you know, before we had microscopes, it was our way of understanding these fungi and these bacteria that were taking nourishment from really hard to digest grains and making something consciousness shifting and also nutritive. So I like to say that all of these old fermentation and vegetation gods are really smalls. They're really fungi that, you know, Jesus and Dionysus are their deities, but they're also fungal gods. So I like to say that. Um, 
These fermented beverages spread all over. We can see them in Anatolian graveyard beer and ancestor reverence. We, we can see Anatolian graveyard beer and ancestor reverence as being a deep shared mythic mycelium in the Mediterranean and in Europe. And of course, my favorite of these gods, these vegetation fermentation gods is the original god of bees, bulls, honey at Demede, Dionysus. Um, so who is Dionysus? You know, we conflate him with Rome and with Greece, but he actually comes from well before the Greek pantheon. He's one of the oldest gods in that area. He first appears in 1250 BCE in the earliest version of Mycenaean ancient Greek, Linear B. We can assume by, by the time his name is actually committed to writing, he's already been around for thousands of years. In fact, Zeus, his father in the Greek Olympic rewrite of older Minoan myths may actually be a sterilized version of him. There was an early version of Zeus personified as a snake that was also called Dionysus. In early stratums of these myths, the two were seen as interchangeable, lightning and vegetation, storm and spore, sky and soil. So I call Dionysus the loud roarer who wails and revel, firstborn, two-natured, thrice-born, vocic king, wild, inscrutable, cryptic, two-horned, two-shaped, bedecked in ivy, full-faced, warlike, howling, holy, divine, victim, feasted every other year, adorned with grapes, bedecked in foliage, evuleths, counselors, zeths and quarry, bore you on a secret bed, immortal daemon, listen happy, one to my voice, sweet and gentle divine inspiration, having a kindly heart with the aid of your chaste nurses. So he is born three times. He is first born. He is various. And the Dionysian myths that survive accentuate this slipperiness. You know, just like fungi interrupt our idea of individuality and the atomized cell and even species, Dionysus disrupts our desire for a discrete individual narrative that follows that arrow of time forward. He is Im immediately symbiotic. He is immediately mycelial in his birth stories, branching off in many different directions from a variety of parents and locations. One popular version begins with the god Zeus, seducing the human princess Semele, daughter to Cadmus, an ancient Greek hero and the founder of the city of Thebes. But Semele is not a Greek name. Historian Maria Jimbutas, among others, postulates that Semele represents a form of Semla, a much earlier Phrygian earth goddess mentioned by Homer, Euripides, and Ovid. Dionysus and his mother then can be connected to the Phrygian populations that existed before the Ionian Greek invaders came down and colonize their mythology. Zeus, a new god of thunderbolts, thunderbolts and mountain summits. So I also like to say that, you know, there's, there's some research that shows that lightning strikes and thunder are associated with, you know, mushroom sporulation events. Um, I was just talking to the mycologist, Patty Cashian about how, you know, there are certain mushrooms, there's certain fungi that produce mushrooms with a kind of um, predictable quality, but there's not a con consensus about what makes a fungal system produce mushrooms, that sometimes lightning and thunderstorm have folklorically been associated with, with, with mushroom events. But, uh, and there've been a couple of scientific studies that have shown lately that lightning strikes can perhaps produce certain types of mushrooms. And I always think it's really interesting that, you know, Dionysus and a lot of these vegetable gar gods are associated with the very storms and lightning that could perhaps um, produce these mushrooms. That's just something I love. Um, yeah. So Dionysus is born of Zeus, a new god of thunderbolts and mountain summits, uh, who copulates with the older female principle of the goddess of the earth. This maps onto the Orphic cult's belief that Dionysus was born of Zeus and the earth goddess Demeter. In a particularly gruesome turn of events, Semele is destroyed mid-pregnancy by the cosmic power of Zeus. He's despondent and he gestates the zygote in his own thigh. So Dionysus is born of man and woman, earth and thunderbolt. He is a blend of genders from the start and also of elements and cultures. So it is no surprise when legends tell us he is born with bull horns or turned into a baby goat. We can assume he existed even earlier than his first textual mention. He is an inheritor of the Minotaur's horns and thus connected to the mythic mycelium of theriomorph magicians like the Lion Man, mediators between the world of human beings and the more than human world. 
The only constant is Dionysus's mutability. Um, the important thing is that when Dionysus arrives, it is not as Joseph Campbell's solitary hero on a quest for origins or an illusory grail. It is not even as an apocalyptic savior with a specific plan for humanity. He arrives grinning, virile, vegetal, and bodied with the grail already in hand. He has his canthros, a ceremonial winged cup filled with ferment and his flowering thyrsus wand conducting vegetal mayhem. So if you haven't read the Immortality Key, it's a really interesting um, archaeobotanical look at all of the different fermentation techniques in the Mediterranean. You know, I, there, one of the theories is that these, these beverages were psychedelic and that often these ecstatic rituals like the Eleusinian Mysteries and the Dion Dionysian Festivals were associated with these, these psychedelic moments. And, you know, there's actually been a lot of testing of these canthros to see what was inside of them. Um, and I, I'm not totally convinced that this is absolutely what was happening, but I do think there's some compelling evidence that the, this was not straight wine, that it had a lot of different components in it. And so Dionysus would often show up when things had gotten rigid and hierarchical with his canthros and his wild ecstatic fermentation that would cause women and slaves to revolt. So he's been submitted to a smear campaign but the truth is that Dionysus used to be an anti-imperial revolutionary figure before the Romans saw reason to um, turn him into a red-faced wino. Um, so I think that Dionysus is the perfect example of a mythic mycelium. Yes, he is ancient. He runs deeper than the pantheons and cultures that celebrate him. Whenever he arrives, he is new though. He refruits, he adapts to circumstances knowing he will be most useful if he shifts his physical and spiritual form to fit the specific needs of a situated ecology. Every mushroom of Dionysus is different. Perhaps then it is more fitting to say he is always born rather than his classical epithets of twice and thrice born and his ability to assess and adapt to changing circumstances, Dionysus behaves like an adaptogenic mushroom. Adaptogens are curious biological mechanisms. While not completely endorsed by Western medicine, as is most non-reductionist holistic practices, adaptogens have been used for centuries across cultures to help bring a body and an immune system into homeostatic balance. Rather than having a specific targeted approach, Adaptogenic mushrooms are dynamic and flexible. Once consumed, they perform whatever specific and individualized balancing is necessary. They adapt to the ecosystem of the human body. They are mutable, behaving intelligently, and in that they seem to make choices about the best approach to biological imbalances. And while these mushrooms adapt to our systems, they also teach our immune and nervous systems to be more flexible and improvisational themselves. Adaptogenic intelligence resonates with Enrique Salmon's concept of resilience ecology. Adaptogens improve a body's ability to adapt to changing conditions. An ecosystem is healthy insofar as it can adapt and come back into homeostasis. For example, the well-known mushroom reishi, Organoderma lucidum, my favorite adaptogen, stimulates the immune system and helps rejuvenate adrenals worn out from chronic overproduction of cortisol in response to stress. It is also reported in studies with mice to promote neurogenesis, the growth and repair of nerve tissues in the body and the brain. When we take reishi, it adapts to the needs and disruptions in our body's ecosystems. Likewise, when Dionysus arrives, he arrives flexibly, chaotically, assessing where he needs to plant his vines and nourish with his fermented mead and food, the disturbed narrative biome of a culture. He is not static. Best of all, when we work with adaptogenic heroes, letting them flow into new shapes that fit our needs, when we tell a different story about an old god, they can act like reishi in that they teach us too to be more flexible. They don't just improve the mythic realm, they improve the bio biotic metabolic lived experience of being a body. So I think I'm gonna end this with talking about how Dionysus was actually, one of his other names was Liber, which is the root for the word liberation. And he was um, actually one of the biggest inspirations behind the two almost effective revolts against the Roman Empire, that of Spartacus and that of Pecula Anya. And he was seen as being highly, highly dangerous and that he motivated slaves and women to revolt against structures of oppression. Um, he was the only God who was officially outlawed 
ever. And we actually see when he's outlawed following the rise of this um, Dionysian priestess, Anya, we see, I think it's about 7,000 people um, killed. Maybe it's 11,000. I'm trying to remember the exact, um, the exact figure, but it's the first example of a mass religious execution based on persecution. It's like the beginning of the Inquisition is well back with Dionysus, with these earth reverent, um, female tolerant, you know, they're often like non-binary people, um, people who had to identify as queer would definitely identify and practice the Dionysian cult. And it was the most popular cult in Rome when it was outlawed. And so it took a lot of work to outlaw it, um, but they outlawed it because they saw it as a real catalyst and driver behind almost successful revolts, in particular Spart Spartacus in the Third Servile War. Um, yeah, so I think that Dionysus teaches us this, you know, this, this vegetal fungal wisdom, which is that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, which is that we have to act like ivy and vines, an invasive species. So he's associated with vine and ivy that, you know, will grow up around a house and turn it into a greenhouse um, uh, um, situation. And the house will begin to mold and fall apart underneath all the ivy. That the best way we can combat systems of oppression is by asking for help from other species, from, from cultures that are not ours, um, from the vines, from the ivies, from the adaptogens, from the reishi. Um, and so I think Dionysus is re a really great example of those theriomorphs we, we began with, which is he's an interface. He's an ecotone between the world of plants and fungi and ecosystems and the world of, of human beings. And so we can tap into that Dionysian element to that vegetal god wisdom when we look to the beings in our ecosystem that are considered disruptive, that are considered, you know, the ones that break down houses, that you want to get rid of, that take over fields. Those are the beings we can look to for lessons on how to dismantle um, patriarchy and colonialism. So I think I'm going to start, stop there and say that there are many other vegetal gods in my talks that I've given for free in my book. Always happy to talk about them. In particular, I love Addis and Adonis and Orpheus, and maybe we can talk about those when we open up the chat. Um, but yeah, I would love to make this less of a monologue and more of a polyphony, um, you know, an ecosystem of voices. So how do I stop share? Stop share. There we go. Perfect. All right. So I'm not seeing any specific questions in the chat. Lots of really great comments, lots of sharing yeah. um, in the chat. And yes, this was just so beautiful. Um, I'm on the Dionysus chapter. So I'm like, I've been feeling it all day <laughs> today. So that was great. Um, yeah, does anyone, um, yeah, Andrea, do you wanna ask your question? And then I can turn anybody's um, audio on that wants to ask a question. And we're going to do it. We're also going to do a giveaway. Um, so stick around after the Q and A. Where we we picked a random attendee to get the book, and we'll mail it to you. Um, so yeah, sure. Um, I just um, this last bit that you were speaking about about the master's tools not breaking down the master's house reminded me of a little quick moment that you said in an interview I recently heard where you said, I'm a fan of invasive species or I'm on team invasive species. And I would just love if you could speak a little bit more about that. Yeah, totally. Um, so I think that in a very Eurocentric idea of um, ecosystem management, which is so hubristic that we live these comet, comet streak brief human lives and then think that we can possibly master and manage ecosystems that are moving on like deep time uh, uh, time scales. That we, I, we create this idea of a climactic ecosystem, but there's no such thing. Trees are mo migrating, the climate is changing, but ecosystems are resilient in as much as they change. <laughs> And oftentimes, you know, there are species that come in to midwife these changes, that come in to create new disturbances that, that open up the space for a, a different type of biodiversity to flourish. 
And so I've oftentimes thought, and of course I'm, I'm working with, I, I'm, I'm jumping off the research of Dow O'Ryan, who wrote an incredible book on invasive species, um, Stephen Buhner, who just passed, Timothy Scott, shown that invasive species have been given a really bad rep but they're oftentimes going into disturbed ecosystems and providing certain kinds of assistance we can't see when we're trying to conserve some um, fictional idea of a climactic ecosystem. So this is one of these things where it's not, there's no right or wrong. You know, Sometimes you need to get the invasive species out, but you can also look to them for advice on how to midwife shifts in the climate that are happening that are going to affect where we're living. That, you know, there's an invasive species where I live that I've been asking for a lot of, you know, help, which is there's a mustard green that has a fungicidal component that brings down, that kills the mycorrhizal plugins of these um, uh, deciduous trees. And so when it kills them, the trees come down and die. And it's seen as being really, really bad. And, but then I was also thinking, because I lived in this area with a lot of these trees, that the climate in the Hudson Valley has shifted remarkably that it gets much less cold, it's much wetter, the soil is destabilized, and these trees with shallow roots, any windstorm, they come down anyway. And so I was like, what if these mustard greens are just killing these trees that are dying anyway, and creating the new soil and the nurse logs that then help trees that are more suited to this environment come in. But it's happening at such a slow scale and in such a non-human way that the easiest thing to do is to just problematize the mustard greens. Okay. Thank you. That was really wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, Riley, I've turned on your uh, audio. <clears throat> can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can. Hello. How's it going? So I'm, I'm Riley Nathaniel. Um, I, I'm, my, uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm, I'm a trans man. I'm a biological female that identifies with the male gender. Um, I want to know, um, um, do you identify as, as feminist? Do I identify as feminist? Um, of, I mean, I think that, of course, <laughs> of course I identify as feminist, but I identify as feminist in a way that is very trans species, that, that, that thinks that gender at, as a tool of, of Euro, Euro patriarchal knowledge is a problematic thing. So my feminism is rhizomatic and its root systems slip into many other species and many other gender expressions and it's intersectional. And if my femi feminism isn't intersectional, and isn't including all of those other beings and other expressions, it's not really feminism. I hope that answers the question. Uh, thank you. I also have another question. Um, um, do you, what are your thoughts on this modern day feminism along with the, um, the uh, behaviors of society that, um, that contribute to um, the, the, male, um, the male attitudes um, because as a trans man, um, you know, we're, we're getting like all this um, scrutiny just, just by being male and um, we're being blamed for like what biological males have done when I'm like, I'm like, I, I, I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> well, yeah, and I just wanna say that, you know, there's a great book that came out called Bitch by zoologist Lucy Cook that really problematizes, problematizes the idea of biological femininity or masculinity at all. And the truth is that, you know, there are many different biological expressions of, of you know, uh, of morphology. And you know, when, once you look away from the human, it gets much, much weirder. So I just always want to problem, problematize this. You know, people are assigned male and female at birth to fit within a very narrow, narrow cultural blanket that doesn't necessarily conform to the entangled chemical biotic holobiont beings that we are. Um, I will really answer your question and say, I think that masculinity and patriarchy have been conflated problematically in a way that has been really bad for people who identify with masculinity, which is it's only one story. 
And if we look at ecosystems, we know that, you know, monocrops are not super healthy, that, you know, ecosystems with many different species are much healthier and able to respond to disruption. Such so should we look at masculinity as probably being an ecosystem rather than being this one bad story of patriarchy. And so part of the reason why I wrote this book was to show that there's actually a long mythic cultural history of more nature reverent, egalitarian, playful, musical, um, wild, ecstatic, androgynous, weird masculinity that's right behind the last 2000 years of patriarchal masculinity. And we could take that and compost it with modern science and modern philosophy in our own lives to create something much more sexy and resilient and weird. And so I saw the men in my life acting out bad stories because they were only given one story. So my answer to that was, can I offer more stories? more stories. Yes. And Riley, thank you so much for having the courage to share with us tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for bringing up how people are, are burdened with holding this one bad story that they didn't own and they, they're not responsible for. Yeah, of course. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's something we see over and over on a daily basis. Yes. Um, anyone else want to um, come off mute and I can turn on your audio. And if not, we can, um, if you can just raise your hand. Um, so I know Craig. Okay. Craig, I'm going to allow you to talk. All right. There we go. I'm just going to uh, repeat my question from up in the chat, I think it got a little lost in the comments. Um, I, I was asking Sophie, do you see yourself branching into Asian or Mayan myths? Mayan myths? Mayan myths, mythology? Oh yeah, well, um, I was raised by um, an ex-Buddhist monk. And so I was actually raised with a lot of um, uh, Zen Buddhism and, and um, uh, Buddhist mythology. And I actually studied that in college, not like that wasn't my main, that was my major, but I studied it with some intensity, Hindu mythology and Buddhism. Um, I don't, I don't feel like I have enough feet under me to write about it in a way that wouldn't be appropriative. And I think that's really important, which is I want to start with the things that I know and that I'm responsible for. Part of the reason why I write a lot about Christianity is become like, is because I come from a ancestry, a European ancestry that was Christian. And I can see Christianity as being such a malevolent force in, in colonialism and an ecocide. So I feel like my personal responsibility is to not turn away from that, but to really look at it, to look at it in the eyes and, and try and take responsibility for it. Okay, so Matt also has his hand up. Matthew. Hey. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Sophie, I really like that talk. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I just was curious, you can, a yes or no answer is fine, but I'm curious if you've ever heard of Robert Moore. Robert Moore, who wrote, did he write King, Magician, and Lover? Yeah. Yeah, yes, I have. I've read that book, indeed. Yeah, okay. yeah I'm going to drop a link in the, in the um, chat. We can all check Actually, it out. Actually, I mentioned it in this book. So oh, I read yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. okay, I'm going to start reading your book. So awesome. Yay. Okay, Johnny, you had a uh, question. And I've got, uh, uh, hi, Sophie. Thanks for speaking to us. Um, so you, you mentioned earlier you had some medical crises and some misdiagnoses. Um, so has your immersion in nature and myth, has that helped you recover and overcome? Well, I think I always want to problematize this narrative of, you know, being sick and then getting better. I have an incurable illness that will kill me <laughs> probably pretty quickly. And so I have to find healing in a body that is non-normative and will not follow the normal healing narrative. I have found great joy. I have found great health in my life. Will I be able to cure this illness? Probably not. So I have to problematize this idea of the cure um, as being some kind of product as, as, I'm, you know, I always say that I'm kind of, a lot of people are haunted by this idea of the healthy self, health, the healthy self that renders your unwell body deviant. 
And the best thing to do is to realize that being well in this culture is not necessarily a good predictor of your ability to survive the coming ecological and social chaos. That in fact, people who are disabled and sick and have incurable illnesses are the, are, have a lot of information about how to improvise with discomfort and with, with chaos and unpredictability. And so, yeah, I sometimes think our disabilities and our illnesses are portals out of an anthropocentric narrative into a more than human culpability with other beings. Um, and also into a sympathy with the fact that they're really undergoing a lot of bodily damage right now. So I would say that my nature connection, and nature is such a fetishized um, European term, you know, we are all nature. Um, but my relationship to my environment is crucial in keeping me here and keeping me alive. I am, I am, I oftentimes say I'm a body plus, I'm a body plus the microbiome I breathe in, you know, my dog, my caretakers, the medicine, the food I eat, I am a body plus. Mm -hmm. And so, did the, and did the, the problems you've experienced, has that caused a, a mistrust in modern medical science? Um, I, I think that's a complicated answer. I think that people who are not white men receive really, really bad care and are often misdiagnosed or have malpractice. Um, and I, you know, the medical in the industrial med medical complex in America in particular is pretty hideous. And, um, uh, that being said, I'm still alive because of medical science and because medical interventions that happened in moments in time when my body was breaking down. So I have a healthy distrust, but I also am really thankful for certain medical technologies that have kept me here. Okay. Thank you. All right, so Priscilla. Hi, um, thank you so much, Sophie. <laughs> I'm an artist in Queens and um, I found my way um, into learning about science through mycelial and fungal networks. And I'm also very interested in divination mm -hmm. and oracles in particular. And I use them a lot in um, adapting them to forms of creative engagement. I'm currently working on a project around Newtown Creek, which you might be familiar with. It's a super fun site. It's um, the creek goes off of the East River, it divides Brooklyn and Queens. And I'm using intuition and creativity as a way to learn about the science and the very long, unfortunately long and toxic history of the creek and also share that learning with other people. But I'm really challenged by learning science. So I use divination and oracles that I invent and things like that to try to learn and retain scientific information. So I'm fascinated by your talk. It's wonderful. And I just have a kind of logistical question, which is I'm trying to find out information about fungal networks, mycelia that live in brackish water. Hmm. If you have, if anyone has any information on that, I would really appreciate hearing from you. That's a fascinating and specific question and something that will send me down a rabbit hole. <laughs> question, but I immediately want to look it up. That's like my favorite thing to do. Okay, so <laughs> yes, I'm going to look it up. You look it up. Let's exchange it. I'll look it up, everyone. Wait, I, I don't mind sharing my email, so I'll just put it in the chat. Okay. And thank you for anyone um, with any insights or, or resources on this. I appreciate it in advance. Yeah, there's got to be some, you know, with, you know, fungi being able to survive in um, vacuums of space, like eat radiation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. seems like no big deal. Well, <laughs> Angel, yeah, I'm looking for, for um, bioremediation as community engagement. So I want to find out what could actually be used that we could work with in kind of a, you know, doable way. <laughs> nice. So I think we have Shan. Hi, uh, thank you. This has been really fascinating. I'm um, interested specifically from like a mythological perspective. I, I was classics graduate. I'm curious to see what tie-ins you have with the Sumerian god Enki. Uh, he was described as the lord of the earth. He was god of semen and, and 
fresh water and all of that and represented by a goat fish. So I guess he counts as a theriomorph too. Yeah. Um, did you see any kind of tie-ins with uh, mycelium and so forth with him? I don't ever want to bullshit and I don't know enough about Enki to talk on him. I do know that Sumerian mythology and part of part of the presentation that I skipped over to make room for time was on Tiamat and Sumerian mythology on a uh, rhizome with Babylonian mythology. And then uh, of course, Judaism, um, cause you know, Judaism is rearticulated through the Babylonian exile and picks up a lot of Sumerian terminology. Um, so I, I see, you see in Sumerian religion, a lot of theriomorphic goddesses that are then through Babylon and through this like diffusion process turned into monsters and you know turned into these more problematic figures and it's a really interesting thing to watch happen which is you see a figure like Tiamat who's initially the earth goddess in Sumerian religion become the monster of um, the Enuma Elish in Babylon in the story of Marduk um, so yeah that that would be my perspective but I don't know enough about Enki in particular I do know that uh, one of his daughters was a goddess of beer, though, so that could kind of tie. Oh up yeah, I forget her name. Yes, yeah, she's yeah. a cool name. Um, it starts with an N. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember either. But <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, yes, and I want to remind everyone that you can save the chat transcript. So if you open the chat, there's like a little ellipses right before the emoticon icon. So make sure that you do that before you, you leave today if you wanna get some of the links and things that were shared. Um, it looks like we have one last question and then we'll do the book giveaway. So Mel. Hi, thanks so much for this talk. Um, I'd be curious to hear if you're open to sharing like how has your work impacted um, any spiritual practices you have and like especially since you said like you didn't grow up kind of within the Christian framework like what has it been like encountering these gods and have you had any interactions sort of outside of like the textual or historical with them I would say I've probably done about 80 interviews on podcasts and answered this at length so I'll give like a very abbreviated perfunctory answer here but if you're more interested I think every podcast I've ever been on has asked me this question my parents are scholars of um, religion and they've hosted interfaith communities and I grew up in a compost heap of rabbis and Theravada and Buddhist monks and nuns and eco anarchists and grew up going to you know Part of my family are Israeli Jews, so I grew up with Jewish practices. My dad was an ex-Buddhist monk. My parents were very animistic. So I grew up practice understanding that, you know, all different faiths were valid. No one was more important than the other. And my parents were really good at, you know, I grew up in a compass heap of all of these spiritual texts, reading them, also going to temple, going to church, going to uh, monasteries, um, so it was very hands-on for me, but as a survivor of early childhood trauma, I would say the, the belief system that really held me was animism, was an understanding that every being was alive and alive differently than me in a way that kept me asking questions. And oftentimes I wasn't super trustworthy of a, trusting of adults or humans, but I was very trusting of fungi and plants and insects and cats and swans and geese. So I would say that my foundation is in a kind of animism informed by all of these different spiritual experiences around them. I, yeah, I don't think the intellectual part came later. I would say the spiritual nature reverent part came first and then was that fueled the more intellectual dive into the actual mythology. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for your questions tonight. And thank you, Sophie. Thank and you so much. yes, this was so wonderful. And thanks so much to Hector for his yes invitation. Oh my gosh, everybody clap emoticon for Hector. <laughs> Hector. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and so um, so yeah, we picked a random attendee tonight with the random number generator. And James, I, am, I don't have a last name for you, but um, your, your name was pulled. And I just need to know your email so we can be in contact and um, 
send you a book in the mail. James, did you hear that? Oh, that's you, James. Everybody clap for James. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay, well, um, if you can just private message me um, your email address, I will take note of that and uh, message you to get your address and additional info. Um, but I appreciate everyone coming out tonight. And we hope to see everyone at um, the tree and re recycled mushroom block giveaway on Saturday. Come out to the HEB on Rula, Runberg Lane, um, uh, Run Runberg and Lamar. Um, and that's all I have for tonight. Thanks again, Sophie. Thank you so much. This was such an honor. Thank you, everybody. James Beard, Mystic Multiples. I got to check out your dot com. Yay. I have some more. Also, I have some more crazy mycological events that might be announced in the coming two weeks. So keep your Yay. ears open. I can't say what they are now, but yeah. Yes. Tag us and we'll share it for sure. Um, so I'm sure there'll be there be people that will want to catch more, <laughs> more. So, yeah. Okay. Thank All you, right. everybody. All right. Thank you, and I'll uh, be in contact uh, with both you and Hector um, to get uh, information for our treasure. Thank you, thank you, Hector. You are amazing. Thank you so much for bearing with me. I can't, I, I, I'm going to look into your speculative fiction because I'm very curious now. Okay. Bye everyone.